morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this roundtable discussion. Uh, and I want to stress it's a discussion. Um, um, so the title of this discussion is Can Traditional Indigenous Knowledge Coexist with Open Web? Um, and I just want to start off with a, of a, of a quick story. We work with a community in Colombia, a young man uh, who, who was orphaned at an early age. And he went to the city to, to start his education. Um, and his connection with his community he went back and found a box of cassette tapes um, that a researcher from Europe went in and uh, interviewed his father, his late father. Um, and on those tapes were uh, songs, traditional songs, stories from the father's childhood, um, and this young man thought it would be interesting to digitalize those, those, those cassette tapes and share them online. Um, soon after, um, his brothers and sisters saw that he was sharing it online and they, he, they weren't too pleased. So sometimes the question is, who owns that material? Was it the researcher that, you know, had the equipment and went into reporters? Was it the late father who's you know, no longer with the family? Um, was it the immediate siblings or was it the community themselves? You know, those are questions that um, sometimes are being asked at this level, but sometimes they're not being asked. Um, so we want to maybe explore some of those questions. Um, obviously, uh, you know, technology has made it easier for people to document things, to be able to archive information and also share online. But I think sometimes those questions aren't being asked um, and how those differences, similarities may be um, considered across regions, across cultures, because you know, no one size doesn't fit all. So we assembled um, just different people from the field of um, you know, documentation, uh, participatory video, uh, academics, researchers, to maybe start those conversations, and also many of you have uh, ideas about that. So um, I'd like to maybe start off with, with Nick. He's with Inside Share. He'll introduce himself. Uh, he's working with participatory video. Um, maybe your initial thoughts on some of those questions about can traditional indigenous knowledge coexist with the open web? Hi everybody, um, so I'm Nick Lunt from England, I'm the director and co-founder of Inside Share, which is an organization that specializes in participatory video, which is a, a collective process. Groups get together and co-create videos. It's the process is, 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 is more important than the product. Uh, participatory video is like a, it's a process of turning the camera on ourselves as a community using it like a mirror to help us uh, really analyze and, and look at the issues that, fa that we're facing uh, to help us decide what we value in our community, in our culture, what might be uh, under threat <clears throat> and to help us come up as a group and community with solutions. So we facilitate those kind of processes and we have been working with indigenous communities for pretty much since, well, since the beginning, since we started the organization 18 years ago. We also work with other groups, um, but my work is focused on work with indigenous communities, and we work long-term with those communities. We, we're invited into the communities by elders who wish to um, develop skills within the community um, in video and documentation. So we train young people to become facilitators and basically do what do our job, do what we do. And that, that takes time, there's a capacity building process. At the moment, uh, well, one thing I want to say right now is uh, when Eddie invited me to join this panel a few weeks ago on, by email, uh, my initial reaction was to say no, because I didn't feel comfortable to represent the views of indigenous peoples uh, at this conference, um, seeing as I'm not indigenous. But then I thought about it, and um, I actually had a we had a gathering in England uh, just a couple of weeks ago with some of our indigenous partners for the first time, by, by good chance, just before this summit. So um, our partner from the Maasai in Tanzania, Samuel, came over. Uh, Annabella and Romelia from the Yaqui and Konkak uh, people in northwest Mexico, and Seno from Nagaland. 
joined us on a learning retreat and I was able to ask some of them uh, to ask this question and also to some other indigenous friends. So some of the information really has just come in literally in the last 24 hours by email. So I apologize, but I've got my laptop because I'm gonna literally read what people have sent me. It's gonna be their words and I have permission to share this uh, these um, contributions with you today. I think I want to ask Suresh, who's a good friend, long-time friend, uh, very involved with the open community. Um, and we've talked about this um, fairly often. I want to get your thoughts, really thoughts on this question. Um, thank you, Eddie. Hi, everyone. My name is Subhashi Fanbrai. I work at the Internet Society. Uh, I founded Open Speaks, which is an open and collaborative pro uh, project to uh, create resources, educational resources for everybody who's trying to document their uh, native languages and create annotations and all kinds of metadata to make their content discoverable and visible on the Internet. Um, so Eddie is my mentor, and uh, we've been uh, I've been associated with the GP community since 2014, and and Eddie has been helping me a lot to kind of share this project. Uh, I got a small break between two jobs, so I was building the project, and Eddie helped me a lot to kind of take Open Speaks to the next uh, next level, and um, and he brought this this very question in the very early stage of uh, the development um, that how do you get permission from the communities from the indigenous communities when you're sharing uh, content which is completely um, theirs and I didn't have an answer to that because the, the logic that he shared with me and the experience that he shared with me was really really important that the, sometimes the native language speakers do not know themselves um, what their privacy means to them right and part of the content, part of the recording uh, of their uh, of the narratives that they share with you, um, could be used against them, and they could be exploited uh, when those content are made available on the open internet. So, internet, which is interestingly, uh, it's an aspiration that the internet should be open. Uh, and, and, a, and a collaborative uh, product of all of us is not open and democratic at this moment. It is closed and it is run by corporations, by big corporations, and it is very uh, authoritarian. So um, I don't have an answer to the question because I still feel that the indigenous communities, it's a long way to go to educate them what the content could be uh, could be used for, and what could be the co um, consequences uh, when that content is made available on the internet. Um, and historically, we have seen how colonization has been, and uh, I'm from India. So most of the Indian language uh, languages, well, the publication, the first publication in most of the Indian languages has been the Bible. And uh, and the reason is when the colonizers came to the country and they colonized the people, the first thing that they did is translating the Bible into the native language and then provide um, that as the first ever published book to the people. So in a way they enabled the, lang the language to be you know, physical, to be used in a physical form before there was a papyrus, um, uh, other kinds of inscriptions uh, on stones and um, you know, metal blocks and so on. But this was the first ever attempt to make it available in a form that's easier to carry to, some, to, to different places, to circle it, and to also educate people. So in a way, it was a good thing, and at the same time, it also made the indigenous communities more vulnerable. Um, so I think it's a check and balance, and it's, it's, uh, it's the archivist to kind of make that human judgment how vulnerable a community would be when you uh, make content from that community available on the internet and if there is any chance that the content, when that content is made available on the internet, could make that community vulnerable to any kind of um, exploitation. Um, there is, there is it's a completely gray area, there is no um, right or wrong or black and white to that. Um, so I would say it, it totally depends on how involved the archivist is uh, with the native language community. If that person understands the community well and understands their problem, understand their historical problems, how they have been in the past, how um, other 
people have exploited them or have other people have um, helped them, then they will be able to make a good decision. But again, it's, it's a completely gray area, as I said before. So as, as we mentioned, um, you know, the te technology tools are making it easier for you know, regular people, people from many backgrounds to be able to take more control over how the information is being documented. Um, it's no longer dependent on outside people to come in who may not know, know the context, may not know the history, to make those decisions for them. But I think we're seeing very interesting examples of how communities themselves are um, Kind of, um, Spanish apropiando, informando, like taking appropriate, appropriate um, you know, these tools for their own use. Um, and so I wanted to ask uh, Simona from Chile, um, who was involved in many projects where um, community members from the Mapuche people are producing their own information <coughs> and deciding how it's used. And then you talk about how communities are, are being more involved in this process. Well, it's a difficult <coughs> uh, question to answer because uh, it always depends on, of, the, of the community, of the specific community. Uh, but in general, uh, our elders uh, are very um, open to, to share uh, uh, different kinds of expression of uh, verbal art. Uh, but with boundaries, and that boundaries are very confusing sometimes because uh, uh, most of the elders uh, always um, tell us that uh, we must uh, share our, our knowledge, we must uh, raise our knowledge, and we must use all tools that we have uh, on, on our hands. So uh, when when we have the moment to, to do that, uh, start to uh, come in the, the, uh, the question, the, uh, well, how, how uh, are, uh, will you do that? Uh, what contents uh, are you going to, to share? This not, because this is too spiritual. Uh, mm, this uh, talks about uh, our uh, uh, our uh, territory that that's a good one to share so uh, you have to uh, make the spaces to to discuss with with the elders to discuss with the with the communities uh, because it's, every territory is different uh, for Mapuche people we have uh, a lot of uh, identities uh, around our territory so we have uh, the people of the sea the people of the mountains and every uh, specific identity ha has their own um, requirements to, to share uh, their, their knowledge. So the digitization efforts that do come forward through these archives are sort of channeled towards other projects. And um, as Subhashi said, well, he said the first books, many of the first books published in native languages in India were the Bible. But this language I work on, it can actually be considered a language of resistance. Because these communities being traditionally trading, they were uh, directly in a conflict of interest with the colonial powers that came, the Dutch, Portuguese, and the British subsequently, because they were only trading monopoly. So um, what happened was, this language actually developed in, uh, in a sense into a code. So it was a secret language. And so it was a language of resistance to many centuries. Therefore, accessing documents itself is quite difficult. Uh, but some of the challenges I've faced in terms of recording uh, traditional um, songs, stories, uh, even some of the more scientific literature of navigation uh, being spoken about, has there's been a sort of resistance because the holders and the speakers of this knowledge are largely women, the older women of the community who sort of lost out in the race to education due to religious and cultural reasons. And they've sort of resisted being recorded for multiple reasons. Uh, one, because Muslims uh, in Sri Lanka are a minority and they're afraid of uh, being targeted for whatever reason. And uh, there's also a prevailing sense of secrecy that sort of follows this language. Um, 
In terms of uh, digitization efforts, well, there have been some attempts to get get round to some documents which are stored in mosques, traditional madrasas, and places for uh, projects like the British Library digitization project. Uh, but it, it has met with a lot of resistance from within the community itself. So um, I'll leave it as well. There are our next guest, Ganga, who will uh, speak in Sinhala. And uh, one of our connectors, Tarina, has offered to translate for her. Thank you. I'm Ganga, but in Sinhala, I think I've heard here. I'll tell you a story in Shishikaka. साक्षात्कार उदाहरण सांप्रदायिक जनजीवित संबंध सांप्रदायिक डिजिटल बल अध्ययनिकेतुवाके संप्रदायिक देश उटेंट 
it's from generation to generation it was through spoken word so like none of this is properly written down or anything of that sort and so she highlighted on one of the researches that she did which is called the Bhatmalava Bhatmalava which is about how the, uh, this is about the harvesting if this is uh, knowledge related to harvesting stuff in the north central province of Sri Lanka where it has been the, the knowledge has been going from generation to generation for nine generations and now after the nine generation is going to be lost because there's no one to take that knowledge forward. So the question again is tying it back to the broader conversation of how much of an access should we give. So it ties back to the question where okay in an indigenous community or like with knowledge where after nine generations if this is going to be lost how are we going to safeguard it and how are we going to make sure that other people have access to it? So it's a question between how are you going to have it on the open internet where the people have open access, but also a question of, so going away, slightly moving away from a question of who has rights to this information is more of preserving the information because we are, when you are at a critical stage where you will lose the information once and for all, you need to make sure you preserve this information because at all points in time it has always been through word of mouth. Right and, and yeah, indigenous medicine in Andhra Pradesh is the same thing where you need to make sure that the information is properly uh, there in the internet for all people to access. Where it's not like uh, how would I say uh, where you just read two pages and you need to pay for the rest. But it's not that. But it's actually open access so that all of this knowledge is not lost because once you develop as a country, you need a point to look back on and then reflect on and also to vote where you're coming from. So, yeah, yeah that's the sound of it. So, um, as I mentioned before, you know, in the context that I work with is primarily Latin America. And uh, you know, we know there are thousands of cultures, each have many different um, approaches to this. You know, some cultures, um, can you hear? Uh, some cultures, uh, don't want themselves to be photographed, for example. Uh, how to deal with those differences? As we're seeing here, over these two days, lots of uh, um, complex issues dealing with digital rights. Um, how do we um, convey that to people who may not be online? You know, do we explain the terms of use of all these sites? Uh, do we um, do we you know, explain okay if we upload something to YouTube? Who would delete it that it still exists somewhere uh, and, and sometimes it doesn't make sense supposed to do someone who may not be um, that familiar with these concepts so my next question and then we'll open up to a discussion or other questions is um, what process does it currently exist that you may be working with right now or what could a process look like to um, help you know people who aren't online understand how this information, this knowledge may be used, may be shared online. Uh, how, how does that process look like in your communities that you work with, or what should it look like? That's maybe like how you deal with that in terms of the video. <clears throat> Thanks, Eddie. Well, I think the key thing is using control. You know, I think the important thing is indigenous people want to have control of how they share their knowledge, how they document their knowledge, what they document, what they share. Um, I'm going to just read a few uh, direct quotes now from the um, from, uh, my indigenous friends who have contributed to this round table. So the internet itself has enabled um, three community leaders, one uh, a Kichwa shaman from the Amazon, Amazonian Ecuador, uh, a Maasai community leader from Tanzania, um, and a Apache medicine man from uh, Arizona to share and to contribute to this round table. <clears throat> That's the first thing. Um, Kurikindi, a Kichwa shaman from the Amazon Ecuador, points out that we can't stop technology. We need to use it, but we must introduce it with great caution. Education must come first. So uh, the idea is to, you know, technology is not, is a neutral tool. It can be positive or negative. So how do we educate ourselves? How do we prepare ourselves? Otherwise, as he says, this powerful tool with the internet can be misused. Um, he talks about information has to be clean when it's shared, otherwise it can spread like a virus. So he talks about information like a disease almost potential. Um, and says also that for us shamans, the internet is nothing new. It's, it's merely a, a physical manifestation of the way we see the world. 
as shameless, how everything is interconnected and how we already communicate. So I found that, I found that very interesting. Um, Samuel from the Maasai, he points out that indigenous traditional knowledge is such a complex thing. It's worthy of learning, but surrounded by ethics, as it, it is also sacred. So traditional knowledge has been transmitted and passed on for years, but through a sacred process using ceremonies, it's done one-to-one, -one, transmission one-to-one, -one, learning by doing. So there's something there about how knowledge is transferred, and the internet doesn't, can't do that. <clears throat> there are laws and customs about how it's truly transmitted, and you know, therefore we need to look at how you, if it's possible to, translate some of those processes into the internet. He also points out that there is, in his words, there is a strong wind blowing towards indigenous knowledge. And there is growing interest around the world to learn from us. The internet is about information sharing, but most of us are not prepared for the internet yet. It feels like, it can feel like our knowledge is being swept away by that wind. So I thought that was very interesting. Michael Hill, uh, Apache Medicine Man, um, <clears throat> said that, in regard to spiritual knowledge, customs, ceremonies, prayers, and the like, I know that these can coexist with an open internet because I've used the internet to do curing ceremonies with peoples not in my country of origin with successful outcomes. That's very interesting. <clears throat> I do share my knowledge with my own peoples and with outsiders, but what I can share is only what I know about what I practice. So this whole thing about who is sharing the knowledge, where is the source of that knowledge, Finally, um, back to Samuel. It, traditional knowledge can only coexist with the open internet if the custodians of that knowledge can stay in control of how that knowledge is shared, how much is shared, and for who. If some knowledge is dangerous, it can cause harm when used in the wrong way. <clears throat> So, share a story for us um, to, to share how com complex this uh, issue is. Um, I was uh, recording my grandma uh, telling me stories, and uh, that was a couple of years back um, when she was with us. We lost her two months back. Um, she was 95 when I recorded, and uh, she was born in the British India, and uh, she didn't go to school. So, her language remained the same over years. Our languages, our language evolved. The language that my parents speak and the language that I speak are very different. Um, so over time, the language is evolving and changing. But our language remained uh, from our childhood. So it was very interesting because at home we literally hear three different kinds of three different versions of the same language. And when I was recording, she asked me, uh, what are you going to do with this uh, recording? Are you going to put this on TV? Because TV is the only thing that she can connect with when it comes to something digital or technology. Uh, I could not explain what the internet is to her because, uh, well, a computer monitor looks like a TV to her. So I tried to explain that, you know, there is there's a huge network and this recording is going to go there and people can access it and so on. But, you know, it just didn't work out. She didn't understand. And uh, when I look, look at Eddie's question, can it be used for anything bad? Uh, my answer for that particular question and that particular situation is no, because I'm recording merely stories and songs and so on. Things that cannot be used. Uh, for any community and make them, uh, you know, vulnerable in any way. But when it comes to traditional med medicine or anything like, like that, and uh, she actually was practicing some kind of medicine, so she would take salt and do something like that and give it to people. And people uh, arguably claim that it worked for cold, fever, and so on, though I never believed it, uh, but it worked for many people. And I. And I am curious, she asked, can you share this before you die? And she said, no, I will never share because you have to be eligible to learn this. And, and I guess this is uh, with a lot of indigenous communities. And I mean, we're not indigenous, but it's with 
the same with a lot of indigenous communities that they do not share the traditional knowledge with anyone. And if you record that and put that on the internet, um, I don't know how how much uh, science is there in the uh, in the traditional medicine practice and so on. So I can't comment on that. But uh, what I could say is it could potentially make communities vulnerable and uh, the archivist has to take great care of it. Uh, knowledge. So sometimes you might record it, but you might not want to share that uh, openly and widely. So the only way to go about that is going through an education for the community, and that might take a lot of time and resource, and the archivist might not afford uh, that, that much of uh, time and resource and everything because a lot of people record things on a go. Um, a lot of times when I'm taking a cab, I talk to the driver and I ask what language I speak and try to record that. And I was doing that once and I realized that I did not ask the driver's name in the first place. Forget about getting the permission to make it available on the uh, internet with a free license. And I so much want to uh, want to share that uh, on, on Wikipedia or Wikimedia Commons uh, in an open license, and I can't just do that because I don't know um, that person's name, and if they permit me to uh, share that on the internet, so it still lies in my heart is, and I just can't do anything else with that. So there is that problem, and uh, I think that exists in all places. But uh, as uh, Simona was saying, uh, talking to the elders in the in the community, and, and you know. Uh, having that consultation with them prior to the recording, uh, making them understand that it's going to be uh, there publicly available to everyone and anyone can access it, and there could be consequences. And if they're okay with that, then one could go ahead and take you know written permission. And I personally do that when I record uh, anyone's uh, interview. I take written permission from them, or at least a digital permission from them. So using a form of some source if they are uh, if they are on the internet, they use the internet. So asking them to fill a form, taking very clear uh, permission from them that this is going to be used uh, on the internet, this is going to be uploaded with a free license, with a CC BY license, which is something I, I normally use, and so on. And also sometimes uh, the licensing terms are written by lawyers, so one has to understand that they have to be translated in Cuban language that people normally understand. And sometimes that need to be translated into that person's native language or the language they are comfortable with. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of great, it takes a great amount of time to make someone understand because um, there are a lot of different gaps, gaps of generations, gaps of languages, um, and um, yeah, I think. Uh,